All right. Yep, I think we got a full screen and now expanding onto another page. Which is great. Um, and I also want to let everyone know I'm working on two screens. So if I sometimes see like I'm looking up in a weird way, it's just because I'm looking at my other screens, um, which you could probably tell if I had my video on. Ah, thank you. We've got a couple more people coming in the waiting room. See several new faces here. It's nice to have more people attending. Mm -hmm. All right. So I don't see anyone else in the waiting room. And so I think that we can get started. Okay. I'll share my screen for a presentation here. This is Alyssa. I am the secretary for the group. For new attendees, if you um, could, if you'd like to be updated on the email list and receive emails from the group, it'd be great if you could um, type your email into the chat, and I will add it to our list. Thank you, Alyssa. Let's see here. Trying to make this visible in the way that's most helpful for you all. Hi, can I ask a question of Aly Alyssa about the email group? Yeah, I'm right here. Hi, is there some? Is that something I could share? Like, I mean, you want to? Do you don't want that shared on Facebook? Do you? Or um, this is just for when I email out the meeting minutes or updates about the planning group. Sometimes. Joel or okay. David will say the planning group is happening. Yeah. Here's the reminder email. For people who want to sign up more broadly, there's an email sign up on the town's website. Oh, okay. That's and that'd good. be a great place to direct people to for signing up. The town website. And that will give you what? What the website? Uh, maybe I'll let David speak to, to that. Well, the town website has this. Okay. The, the town website has a subscribers list for the news items. So, um, and this is this is sort of in transition. Uh, we're working on getting a new system set up so that we can keep everybody up to date on a more timely fashion. Okay. But for now, in the under news in the town of Danby, New York, mm -hmm. ny.org website, uh, you can scroll all the way to the bottom and there's a place to put in your email to subscribe. Okay, great, because uh, a couple of people don't have Zoom or cell phones, so this I was wanted to ask how they could stay in, involved, and they wanted to know. I'm asking on their behalf. Thank you so much. All right, I think this is the best way to share. Can everyone see this screen? Okay. Yes. Excellent. Yep. Uh, so uh, just a little housekeeping. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is David West. I'm the town planner, and. Uh, the way this meeting is going to work today, it uh, will be around two hours. Um, we'll have a presentation for, uh, I'm guessing, probably about the first hour and then have time for um, conversation. Um, I want to welcome all the new people who are here. Um, it's great to have you. It's great that uh, word got out to you and that you had a chance to come and get involved. Um, I want everyone to understand that we're at the very beginning of a process. Um, so if you've heard that there are certain, you know, specific things proposed, um, we are at the, the start of proposing things, but there is absolutely nothing that's written in stone right now. So this is a, a chance to be involved over the next um, nine months with shaping the zoning rules for the town. Um, looks like we're getting Great, some chat coming in, people sharing emails to get on the email list. Um, so I'm gonna jump into the presentation. Uh, we are here in the town of Danby and we're working on a zoning update. So what's going on? What brought people here tonight? Um, this year, 
the town of Danby has committed to making long overdue changes to zoning and subdivision rules. Uh, there's a plan to have it completed by the end of 2021. Um, and I, I think there's a few good things about this. One is that you know, you know, for everyone who's a busy person but cares about what's going on in the town, this is the time to get involved for these next few months to really shape um, the way these new rules are going to be formed and adopted. Uh, so what set this in motion? Um, the town adopted a comprehensive plan in 2003 and then updated it in 2011. Both of those processes uh, were before my time, but my understanding is that there was significant community participation. A lot of thought went into um, getting an understanding of where the town was headed, how things are going, what changes should be made, um, and what the future of the town should be. And you know that's a really long-term way of thinking. And um, one thing that is supposed to come out of that is updating the zoning. And since then, there has been some some small changes to the zoning. I think the zoning is always getting tinkered with a little bit, um, but there has not been a major overhaul to implement this comprehensive plan. Um, to get started on that, uh, when Joel Gannon, the supervisor, was elected, he started um, a wide-ranging planning group. Um, I believe this started in early 2020, and um, that group has been meeting through the pandemic. There is a, a small break. Um, while the town uh, went through different planners, um, getting me on board. And since I've been on board, um, starting in December, the groups have been meeting again uh, and moving forward. And I'm gonna talk about what they've accomplished later in the presentation. Um, as they've gotten to the point of working on specific adoptable ideas, I'm starting to make proposals for how rules may, might change. Um, the town board passed a moratorium on subdivisions in the low density residential zone last month. Um, this is to put a press pause on um, new subdivisions in most of the town while the town is updating these rules to make sure that we don't have a rush of subdivisions you know, trying to get in uh, under the rules that uh, we've kind of established are really not working um, so that we can really um, work with all of the uh, members of the community and come up with some strong zoning that we can support and, um, and then open back up for subdivision going forward. So what's a moratorium? It's a temporary pause of land use approvals. There's lots of kinds. The one that the town adopted um, puts a pause on new subdivision applications in the low density residential zone. Um, and it expires at the end of 2021. So we have approximately nine months right now to get um, new rules in place uh, before we kind of reopen that process of subdivision. Some things that it doesn't do, it doesn't stop you from getting a building permit. If you um, want to build a house um, or build another building, you can still do that. It doesn't stop things in other zones. Um, and also there's a process um, there's a process for hardship. If you own land and there's some reason that it really needs to be subdivided during this time, um, the town board put in a process for you to apply, explain what the hardship is, um, and be able to grant a waiver in special circumstances. So what we're talking about now is this process of updating the zoning. And it's a big deal for a town. It, it usually takes a long time um, and, I'm, and requires a lot of effort, a lot of hours from a lot of people. Um, and I'm impressed with the town board um, really being committed to getting this done as quickly as possible. Um, having a moratorium for just nine months with an expectation of having zoning ready at the end of that is a quick timeline. Um, and it's also being a compact timeline means um, that it's a chance for people to really engage heavily. And the town board has committed to having an extra meeting, um, spending extra time of their own every month um, to uh, keep this process on track. So what is zoning? Zoning is the most basic rules for what's allowed to be built in the town. Um, is our zoning working? Uh, the question there is, do you like the way the town is changing? You know, no one can stop change entirely. Change is inevitable. 
but we get to decide how the town changes, what kind of town we become. And zoning is really the DNA for how a town develops. Um, and right now, you know, a lot of the complaints that we get, a lot of the issues are related to how our zoning is structured and what it allows. So uh, the comprehensive plan had a lot to say about zoning and I'm not gonna read all of it, but I'm gonna run quickly that the comprehensive plan specifically called out um, a desire to prohibit or discourage development on erosion prone steep slopes, protect uh, natural resources, providing sensible and flexible development patterns, um, use conservation overlay zoning and incentive zoning, rural development guidelines, um, streamline the development review process, make it easy to do the things that people agree should be allowed, um, establish conservation standards for unique natural areas and buffer zones, preserve and support historic and cultural resources, um, identify the impact of current zoning on development of actively farmed or unused farmland, um, explore cluster, flag lots, rural compounds, create rural developed guidelines and de design criteria, um, consider more protective language and specific references um, for working with historic landscapes, developing design standards for new construction that reflect Ambi's architectural heritage, prohibiting land uses that encourage or result in the loss, degradation, and destruction of historic and cultural areas, farms, farm buildings, and open landscapes, encouraging and incentivizing preservation, um, utilizing cluster, transfer of development rights, planning, and zoning tools, pres preservation of historic farming communities, um, and the use and adoption of modern zoning, land use tools, and uh, such as transfer of development rights. Um, so there's, there's a lot that's called for to change the zoning um, and it, it's a big job for us. So the zoning is a 73 page ordinance um, adopted by the town, first adopted in 1991. It's had updates over the years. The most recent one was in September of 2020, um, but those were relatively small amendments. The structure uh, really dates back to the 90s. There are rules for each zone in the town. Um, there's general rules for all zones, special use rules, um, processes for site plan review, special permits, processes for the planning board and the board of zoning appeals for rezoning for enforcement and permitting and interpretation by the zoning officer, which is me. So what does the zoning say? Um, first thing that's important to note is that most of the town is in one single zone. It's in the low density residential zone. So um, right now we're treating most of the town the same. It's one set of blanket rules. It allows two acre lots and an average density for new subdivisions of one lot per five acres or one lot per 200 feet of road frontage. Um, for yards, it requires a 50 foot front and side yard, 75 foot rear yard. Um, and accessory buildings have to be 10 feet from a rear side yard. It's a height limit of 36 feet from the lowest exterior grade. Um, and as an example of what the zoning gets when it's applied, um, the build out of Yaple Road is an example of five acre average density. So this kind of pattern of development where you have a house every 200 feet um, and five acre lots on average that's currently allowed basically everywhere in the town. Um, and we're gonna look, you can look at this map, everything that's green is the low density residential air zone. Um, and so you can see at the same scale, we have different contexts that are within that zone. You have the Yaple Road context um, in the upper left-hand corner there where you can see those uh, five acre lots, um, very suburban, um, you have Bald Hill Road near the Hamlet, which is kind of a similar context, slightly larger lots, but frequent uh, built up all along the road. We're applying those same rules to places like Lane Road and Peter Road, the Puchin Hollow and Hillview Road, um, places where uh, you currently have large, um, large lots, really large lot sizes, not a lot of development along the road and some um, pretty sensitive ecological features. Um, so what else does zoning say? It lists permitted uses. 
Um, so in the low density residential zone, the permitted uses, meaning um, if you wanna build one of these things, you can just apply for a building permit with no further review, are one or two family homes, public utility structures, customary ag uses and structures. Um, so that's allowed the same, by the same rules, the same lot sizes um, across almost all of the town. Accessory uses, um, there's garages allowed. Uh, one of the issues here is there's no size limit for garages. So it's, it's kind of unclear on how much of a garage can be accessory. You can have a 10,000 square foot garage, perhaps. Um, there's a res one residential storage building that's no more than 400 square feet. Um, but again, there's no limit on garages. So you could have um, <coughs> multiple garages or, or really large garages, um, recreational facilities for occupants. So pools, tennis courts, that kind of thing. Building mounted solar, small scale solar, custom farm, customary farm buildings, roadside stands. And then we have a list of things um, required permitted by special permit. So that means these things are allowed everywhere, um, but before someone can do them, they need to go to the planning board um, and the planning board has to review to make sure there's no special circumstances that would uh, make that use um, problematic on a particular lot. Uh, and then we have large scale and solar energy facility, large scale solar and solar energy facilities are permitted with site plan review. So these allowed uses um, are in the low density residential and the exact same uses with no changes are allowed in the medium density residential. The only difference between low and medium is you can have slightly smaller lots and a slightly smaller rear yard. In both the low and medium, you're required to have a 50 foot front yard. The medium density residential zone, if you look back at the map, is kind of right in the middle of both of the hamlets. Um, there you've got a requirement for 50 feet front yards. That's not at all the context that is actually traditionally built in either of those locations. Um, and you'll notice there's no, uh, there's no option for any commercial uses in any of those areas, which you can see uh, takes up a, a lot of the hamlet uh, both hamlets. In the high density residential zone, it's really not high density. Um, it's the same uses and same building areas and same height as allowed in low density and medium density. The only difference is hotels and multifamily are allowed with a special permit. Um, the lots can be a little smaller down to one acre, 150 feet of frontage or smaller in the West Sambi Water District. Um, and the side yard can be slightly smaller. But really there's not a huge difference between low, medium, and high density the way the, the town currently has them defined. And it really doesn't allow, um, it doesn't allow any preservation of uh, the places in the town that have been historically open and large lot, and it doesn't allow um, infill of the historic hamlets. Um, when it comes to commercial uses, Zoning is extremely restrictive and cumbersome for if you're a small local startup. There's nothing that you can do without going through a several month process with the planning board. Um, a lot of businesses require a planned development zone because the zoning just doesn't fit them. Um, there's a requirement for at least an acre and there isn't any provisions that allow mixed use. Um, so between um, issues with the medium and high density residential zones not being medium and high density and then uh, the commercial zones being difficult uh, to use makes it very difficult to build out the hamlet um, in any meaningful way. In addition to the zoning, uh, controlling development, we also have the town stormwater law. This is a 26 page law um, that outlines three different levels of stormwater protection plans. Um, that are required for different levels of ground disturbance. So half an acre to a full acre of disturbed area or work within 50 feet of any water body um, requires a simple SWIP, which basically focuses on construction protection, stopping runoff during the construction process. Um, if you go larger, one to five acres, you have a basic stormwater pollution protection plan 
um, that has both construction protection and post construction features. Um, and there's a, a much larger full SWIP required for more than five acres of disturbance. Um, all of this is, is good things. It's a lot of extra process, especially for the really small projects, um, but it does help us to provide some protection um, to the town, and especially to our water bodies when um, work is being done. In addition to the stormwater, there's our subdivision ordinance. Subdivision ordinance is 49 pages. It uh, chronicles the process for three kinds of subdivisions. There's a minor subdivision, which is only for two lots, creation of two lots, and everything has to meet the zoning. Um, in that case, the process is relatively straightforward. Um, it still requires going through the planning board, uh, multiple months of meetings, um, fees, applications. Um, the review is relatively minor because um, this is really just for splitting a lot where everything follows zoning. So anytime someone needs a variance or doesn't need zoning parameters in any way or creates more than two lots, um, that's a standard subdivision. The standard subdivision has uh, the option of being a cluster or being a normal standard subdivision. Uh, the process is longer. Um, you have at least three or four meetings with the planning board um, in pursuing a subdivision. Uh, the cluster subdivision option allows the planning board to waive a lot of zoning requirements in exchange for a kind of uh, siting that minimizes environmental damage. Um, there is, is a broad um, process of things that you need to uh, figure out when you enter into the standard subdivision process. You need to map all of the natural resources um, for your lot um, before you get to proposing how the lot's going to be subdivided. Bring that to the planning board. Um, they review that as well as your plans. Um, they can uh, require changes in the layout of uh, lots um, based on those natural resources. One thing this um, whole process doesn't do is it doesn't actually reduce development rights at all. So because most of the town is in that low density residential zone, you're allowed a lot for every five acres. Um, and those lots can be as small as two acres. So nothing in the subdivision requirements is allowed to reduce the number of lots that you can get. So even though the planning board is gonna look at um, wetlands and forest areas and uh, unique natural areas and slopes and um, all of those different things, um, they're not allowed to reduce the number of lots that you can gain um, in that process. Um, and one of the things that's really difficult for the town is most of the time when someone comes forward with a subdivision, um, they don't actually know what's going to happen with it, right? They come forward and say, I just want to cut off five acres of my lot here, or I'm going to cut off two pieces of five each and then have, you know, the rest left over. But I'm just going to sell them. I don't know what's going to get developed on them. Um, and doing that kind of piecemeal development um, doesn't allow any planning to happen. It makes it difficult to follow our requirements. Um, and I'll also say that the requirements are uh, very stringent. They're uh, difficult to understand. There's a lot of different processes. Um, I don't think that they have always been particularly well followed. I know it was definitely a learning curve for me to get all of the various components to mesh together. Um, and because of that, it's difficult for landowners, it's difficult for neighbors to figure out what's allowed. Um, and also the town ends up spending money that may not necessarily be needed otherwise on legal battles that can be um, costly and prolonged and difficult both for the community and um, for town. So what are we trying to do here? Um, the town's enacted this nine month moratorium. During that time, we've committed to creating sub areas within the low density residential zone. Um, so if we go back to this map, 
we have the green area that's the entire town. Um, I think we can all recognize that within that green area are a lot of very different contexts. There's different kinds of places that deserve different kinds of rules. And there's different neighborhoods that will have different tolerances for development. And there's some places that are fully developed already um, where there's no point in trying to um, control the development because it's already happened. And the rules um, that are there are the rules that created that place. And then there's other areas that, you know, haven't been developed and some places where people don't want to see development. So um, we have a bunch of different contexts. We have different contexts and part of this process is to identify those different contexts and create rules that make sense for each of those contexts. Um, while we're looking at that, uh, it's also become apparent that the town needs to adopt some new public and private roadway and driveway specifications, um, as well as rules for how those are used in the development of lots. Um, so right now the town has one, uh, it's called a highway specification. That one specification is 20 foot uh, paved way with a 10 foot lane in each direction with um, four foot shoulder on each side of that and then an eight foot ditch and a 50 foot wide clear area. Um, that works well for a high speed um, through road. It doesn't really create a kind of quiet um, back country um, rural character for a house that for a road that just has a few houses on it. Um, so it makes sense to think about um, less environmentally damaging um, roads that could be options for places that a new road is gonna be built to just serve a few houses. Um, in addition to that, uh, there is, is a legacy of inconsistencies and other problems in both the zoning and the subdivision ordinances. So because these documents have existed for a long time and there's been a lot of changes um, over the years, there's things that have become inconsistent either with current case law or current state law or just things that, you know, errors that got added into the code over time or things that don't make sense or things that conflict between the zoning and the subdivision um, or that create confusion or conflict. So uh, three planners before me have all left lists of things that need to be fixed in the zoning. Um, we're going to be working through those, um, and that's, you know, part of the reason for the moratorium is it's just impossible to do this amount of work while we have a constant uh, flow of new projects that require this intensive review. Um, so the moratorium allows us a little uh, space for both me and for the planning board and for the town board and for the planning group to work on this process and spend time evaluating where does the town want to be in 20 years? How are we going to get there? How do we make sure that all of the rules uh, make sense and are clear? And that's our end goal. To create a clear set of regulations um, and approval criteria that can be understood, that landowners can follow, um, that neighbors can understand, and that is possible to have every project follow all of the rules and all the processes um, through the work with the public and with town staff. Um, so I think that's a really good goal for these nine months. Um, we have some other tasks to complete as well. Um, working with a Hamlet group, we are looking at incentivizing development in the Hamlet areas, fixing the zoning there because that's where the comprehensive plan says development should be focused and it's really where the community has said, you know, we want some the amenities that the hamlets have lost, that the town has lost. So we want the hamlets to be kind of the real um, cultural heart of the community. And that's hard when there isn't very much there. Um, so that involves creating new zones that support small scale development and small businesses in the hamlet that make it easy for them to locate and function there, uh, minimizing barriers to bringing in those wanted amenities and housing where it makes the most sense. Um, beyond that, uh, the general code um, 
code tasks here beyond just fixing the low density residential zone is again, making the code easy to understand and enforce, making process clear for owners and neighbors. Uh, when people are doing the kind of development that the town wants to see, that should be easy. It should be a clear process. Um, and then it shouldn't be possible to do what the town says they don't want, or at least it should be, there should be a lot of review and a lot of process. Um, so the goal is that what the community says is their goal is something that someone can do with as simple a process as possible and things that need additional review will still require that additional review. So what's been done already? Um, as I mentioned at the top of this presentation, um, Joel started the planning group um, at the beginning of last year and structured that group so that literally anyone in the town can be involved in it. Um, and by showing up, you get a vote in that process. Um, so it's structured in a way that's very open and encourages um, anyone and everyone to participate. Um, as part of that, the main planning group has several working groups. Um, those working groups are the Hamlet working group, the conservation working group, public outreach working group, and a tax working group. So far, accomplishments of those groups. Um, the tax working group, I think, was a, a real early success. They identified that one of the major problems for large landowners in the town um, is that rising taxes are expensive. And um, one way of paying those rising tax bills is to subdivide. And a lot of people don't want to subdivide, um, but they feel that they need to because of the financial burden of rising taxes. So this group put together um, a process where a landowner could uh, take on um, a less than permanent conservation easement. So a conservation easement for, um, I think, starting at 15 years and going up. Um, the longer the time of the conservation easement, the greater the tax reduction. Um, but the thinking was, there's already a tax reduction available for permanent conservation easements. Um, these tax reductions would be available for non-permanent easements. So someone who wasn't comfortable um, locking down a parcel forever could test it out with a shorter term. Um, and of course, with that shorter term comes a, a smaller tax break, um, but as a way to incentivize people to try that out. So uh, the town board passed a resolution supporting this system um, and asked the state legislature to adopt it. Um, in order to do this, we need the state to pass a law allowing the town to do so. Um, since that resolution was passed, I've been working with um, Anna Kell's office and Pete Oberacher's office, and they are supporting this um, law and being drafted by Anna Kell's office and will be brought to both the Assembly and the Senate this year for adoption. Um, and really hopeful that it will uh, be able to go forward. There's, there's only several other towns that have gone this route. Um, so it's nice that we're not the first, it's not something totally foreign, um, but it's not something that most towns have. It's, it's relatively unique. I think that is definitely a success that's come out of this process. Uh, the Hamlet group, has worked to identify a core Hamlet area and a Hamlet neighborhood area. Um, these are draft maps and I'm gonna be showing you where you can find all of this information um, in a few minutes. Um, in addition to that, they've worked on brainstorming um, what kind of, what the vision for the future of the Hamlet is. And what's really come out of that is people saying that the Hamlet should be you know, the cultural heart of the community. It should be a place that has some more amenities, some of the things that have been lost, like a place to shop, um, also uh, kind of third places, um, a place for people to hang out that's not their home and it's not their work. So things like cafe or an ice cream shop or a restaurant, something like that would be nice to have in the Hamlet again, um, as well as being a focus of residential development so that you have a place for smaller lots that are more affordable and for smaller scale housing that also brings an affordability option um, and a different option that's not available in other parts of the town. Um, in, in order to further that vision, um, they've worked on 
starting some ideas for Hamlet core zoning. So they identified kind of two zones in the central Danby Hamlet, the core area and the surrounding area, which we're calling the neighborhood area. Um, we basically had one meeting starting to look at a rough proposal for zoning ideas for that Hamlet core area. And uh, there's still a lot of room for input there. Um, uh, that those meetings will be ongoing and then we'll move on to the Hamlet neighborhood area. The conservation group uh, started, um, they've worked on a, a lot of different thoughts about how we should decide what conservation should mean for the town. What is the rural character that the um, comprehensive plan says many times that we should be protecting? There's a lot of different views about what exactly is it that we wanna conserve in the town. Um, the, one of the recent, I think, successes of that group is starting to identify specific zones um, that we could carve out of the current low density residential zone, because that's really the impetus for uh, this big push of doing, getting a zoning update done in the next nine months is um, finding um, different parts of the low density residential zone where we want to or don't mind seeing development in areas where we want to see less development and developing different rules for those different contexts. So the, the group has honed in on uh, currently five different zones. Um, we haven't put these on the ground. Um, we, we worked in the last meeting on some kind of looking at the, some different kinds of areas that we think these zones would apply to, um, but all of it is still you know, open for change. So uh, they identified that we have um, county identified unique natural areas. There's some really special uh, natural areas in the town that are deserving of specific protection. Um, then there's a lot of other high priority ecological preservation um, areas, areas where we want to see less development than is currently allowed. Um, and we've started looking at some zoning ideas for how we could, could accomplish that. Uh, we've started looking at another category of working land. So that's farms, forests, um, areas where uh, we still want to have, you know, mostly open space, but, you know, it's not such an ecological priority. It's more about keeping mostly that large lot format and making ways to have clusters of housing in it as well. Uh, we did a significant amount of work around riparian corridors. So we wanna have an overlay zone for areas that are um, within a hundred feet of uh, year round streams and 50 feet of uh, intermittent streams. That would be an overlay zone. And then, you know, a realization or a, um, the concept that there's parts of the town that are already suburban neighborhoods and that have been fully developed under the current zoning and that the current zoning makes sense for. And um, so, you know, the, the purpose of this isn't to change the zoning for all of the low density residential area. There's some areas that that zoning makes sense for and that it can provide some continuity for. So identifying the areas where um, that makes sense, um, areas where we would like to see more of that kind of development that would stay with uh, the current zoning rules. Uh, moving forward from there, I have a, a schedule for the rest of the year. So the first quarter, the town passed the moratorium, um, started scoping for the zoning update, um, reviewed all of the past zoning and subdivision regulations and problems, gathered data. The second quarter, we're starting this public process. Um, so it's great to have you all here tonight. We're gonna spend some time uh, to hear from you, to discuss um, these concepts um, and to talk about how you can be more involved. Uh, and this is just the beginning. There's gonna be a lot more opportunity going forward. Um, but I think we need to hear from more people about what is working, what isn't working, um, and you know, get everyone on the same page with understanding how the, the existing processes work and what should be fixed and what should be protected. 
Um, during this month, we are identifying those new zones and I hope that we can shore that up and get to a point where uh, we have uh, agreement on the list of zones and the purpose of each of the zones within the low density residential area um, so that then we can have the rest of the year uh, to work on those. In May and June, I'll be drafting those new zone zoning rules um, in concert with uh, the, the conservation working group um, and the town board. And again, there's a new meeting of the town board every month that's gonna be focused just on these zoning updates. So it's a chance for people um, to know that once every month you can go to those meetings, get an update, um, get your voice heard, um, and also a chance for the town board to make decisions to keep the process moving forward. In the third quarter, um, in July, I'll be presenting a draft um, to the town board and the planning group. Um, after that presentation, we'll kind of pause for three weeks for the community to review, to provide comments, to ask questions, to get clarification, um, uh, to make sure that, that everyone understands what is being proposed and has, has an opportunity to comment on it. Um, in August at that extra town board meeting, um, the town board will hear from the public. We'll have public forum for feedback on the code um, and a chance for the town board to process that and decide um, how they wanna direct the process going forward. Um, which of those comments do they want to use to make changes? Um, are there elements of the code that need significant further consideration? Are there things that were missed entirely? Are there things that should be taken out? Um, it's, it's a chance to kind of check the progress and um, give me further direction moving forward. Um, at that time, you know, there'll also be the opportunity for um, all of the other boards that uh, exist in the town, the CAC, the planning board, um, the board of zoning appeals, um, all of the working groups will have the draft, be able to review it and be able to provide feedback to the town board. That will really be the sounding board and creating the direction for the process moving forward. In September, um, I'll get back to the board with changes based on their direction to me in August. And we'll have another chance for feedback from the public. It'll be a second draft. We'll have changed some things. Um, some people will probably like those changes. There'll probably be some things that people would still like to have changed. Um, and that, that'll be a chance for more feedback and review. In the fourth quarter, our goal is to finalize and adopt something. Um, this may not be a complete new zoning code. It's most likely incremental changes. Uh, definitely those new zones um, within the low density residential. You know, I, I hope that we'll be wrapping in as many of those structural changes as we can, as much of the Hamlet updates as we can. Um, we'll spend October having working sessions um, to focus on areas of disagreement. Uh, I've done this with a lot of different towns. I can tell you there are gonna be places that people just don't agree. Um, and the best thing that we can do is pull people together and find something that works for most people. Um, there's always gonna be some level uh, where people are, not everyone is gonna agree on every piece, but I hope we can find something that uh, most people can agree is fair um, and can support moving forward. Um, again, there's no point in adopting something that has a huge amount of opposition um, if it's just gonna end up getting changed uh, by the next town board. In November, uh, will be a chance for the town board to hear again from the public um, and to give me final direction on any further changes necessary to have something ready to adopt <laughs> in December. Um, and then in December, my great hope is that they will adopt um, a set of changes uh, that affect the zoning um, at a minimum for the low density residential zone um, that clean up the subdivision process. Um, and at that time, at the end of the month, the moratorium expires and people will again be able to apply for subdivision, um, hopefully under rules 
that the town board and the planning board and the CAC are all comfortable with moving forward. Uh, so, so during this pause, our plan is to have lots of public input. We're starting with this uh, chance to get everyone on board with exactly what's going on and where we're going. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of ways for you to be involved going forward. Um, I mentioned that the town board is having their extra meeting every month uh, with updates on the process provided ahead of time, opportunities for feedback in those meetings um, and decisions made by the board to keep this on track and as short as possible so we can get back to allowing subdivisions. You know, nobody likes, um, you know, taking away a right to do something in the town. So we, we wanna keep that as short as possible. And then how do we stay in the loop? So for that, I'm gonna exit out of the presentation and go to the town board, town's website. All right, so uh, the town's website is the main portal that you can get information through about this process. If you go to the town's main webpage, townofdambyny.org, right at the top of the page, you'll see the town has temporary pa temporarily paused accepting new subdivision applications. We've had the, the notice for this meeting. Um, information that we are working through these nine months to update the zoning and subdivision process. And there's a form right here that you can click. You click on this form, um, you can put in your email address, make sure you click submit, and then that will add you to a list to get updates from my office as we go through this process about every meeting. Um, you can also use this form to put in um, comments that will be shared directly to the planning group and the town board. You can use this for any kind of comments throughout the process. So anytime during this process that you feel um, like you need to say something, this is one way you can do it. Of course, you can always email the town board. You can always email me, you can call my office. Um, and the best way is to be involved in these meetings and to have your voice heard there. Um, but this is an option for everyone to be asynchronous. You don't have to be able to be in a Zoom meeting um, you can you can check on it anytime you want and provide comments or or get updates that way. In addition to that, you go to the town's calendar. Here is where you will always find um, information about meetings. I assume most of you got the information there. Um, we've got the planning groups meetings monthly, the town board uh, monthly moratorium update, Zoom meeting. On here, you can see. Uh, the third Monday of every month, um, in addition to the working groups. And um, you can get to the planning and zoning department page for more information about the zoning update. So um, this is where I'll be uh, posting things, um, keeping you up to date on what's going on. Uh, we also have under boards and committees, the planning group, um, as well as the two working groups. Uh, so on this page, uh, we post planning group minutes. There's links to the working groups, the conservation working group, the Hamlet working group, the tax policy working group. Um, we also post videos. So this video uh, today is a planning group uh, meeting. So it will be posted. Um, you can go to the Hamlet working group page and you can find um, various information pieces of information there. So I mentioned that the Hamlet group had worked on a map. So you can go to that web page and find the map that shows the two zones that they've been considering. Um, all of the stuff that goes up there, it's completely draft at this point. It's not um, formalized. We wanna get your feedback on it. So you can go look through the various documents that are there um, and participate in that way. Um, I wanna make it as easy as possible for the, the broadest uh, spectrum of people in the town to participate. So you can participate live in the meetings. You can watch the meeting after it happens and send comments to me. You can read the documents, send comments, um, send comments that you want shared with all of the working groups. 
Um, there's a lot of ways for you to be involved and uh, to get updates through our webpage and through our um, emails. Stop sharing my screen. And this is a chance um, for us to talk about this, talk about this process, um, talk about the things that you wanna see, uh, the ways that you wanna be involved, the ways that we can get more people involved um, and how we can make this the most effective moving forward for the town in the time that we have. Yeah, before we get into that, the, the uh, mention wasn't made, but there is another working group that's been formed since we, uh, in, in recent weeks here, and that's uh, Alyssa Davidier and, um, and Betsy Kiyokoski were willing to have a group that's focused specifically on agriculture and are looking to have others join them in that um, effort. And that will um, complement what's going on in the conservation group or the, or the zoning outside the Hamlet group as it's kind of come to be known and broader in scope. Um, looking specifically at what needs to be done to support agriculture and where uh, in the town that agricultural zones might be best located. This is Alyssa. I'll just uh, briefly say Betsy and I haven't gotten yet to reach out to anyone, but we're going to be reaching out to folks in the town who we think might be uh, specifically interested in that. Um, and we're going to be particularly asking farmers what would help them and if there's any zoning changes or things that they thought in the zoning might help encourage agriculture to help preserve the rural character of the town. So that's a little brief blurb for people who might be interested. And if anybody here is interested, um, if you could just submit, mention that in the chat and that will get uh, help jumpstart that effort. And there is a comment, Joel, in the chat. Um, how do people participate if they either have no computer or an internet service provider, so they're wondering how to participate with less technology. Good question. Um, we have a few people who are challenged in that way. Uh, you know, email is a good one, but uh, if you don't have any, if you don't have a computer at all, then even that's hard. And there's, I've been trying to do it. I mean, Alyssa, your, your notes are really good for those who have access to them. Um, and we have been sharing those by email, but again, if you don't have email, you're, you're really in, in, uh, in bad way as far as participating at all. The updates in the Danby News give you the gist of what the major thrust is, but it, uh, it'll be very hard for people to participate unless they can, unless they can um, have some electronic connection. Yeah, I will say, Joel, that um... One of the good things about Zoom is that anyone with a phone can participate in this meeting. Um, so you can call in, you don't have to be able to run Zoom on your computer. Um, you don't have to have a smart device, you just need a phone. Um, and that may be, you know, getting that information to people is not as easy. Um, uh, the, the meetings, all of these meetings are posted by the Dan B. Community Association on their physical signboard um, at uh, Dotson Park, um, as well as, you know, they're happy, welcome to give me a call and I can let people know um, when the meetings are because they're recurring. Um, so you can know when the meeting is going to be this month and next month um, for the rest of the year and know how to call in um, for those meetings. Not being in person, I understand it is difficult. It's a hard time for people who aren't online. Um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully things will get better there soon. Um, I actually have my second uh, vaccination this weekend, which I'll be glad to have. And, you know, hopefully we'll get to a point where we can meet more easily in person. Can I just add, uh, as far as the agricultural uh, working committee goes, we are thinking of the range not just as farmers with fields and cows, but also small scale farmers um, and even homesteaders that have a, a, a strong interest in preserving um, agriculture for 
for interest in their own gardens and maybe chickens or whatever they have. So if you know of anybody that might be interested, uh, please have them contact or her uh, contact Alyssa or I, because we're thinking of actually having an outdoor in the park Saturday afternoon, <laughs> socially distanced connection, be just for the reason that a lot of people don't have Zoom that might be interested in agriculture. And it, Thank you. If I could say, if I could say something too, that would include operations like ours, a little tree farm. I mean, tree farms are part of the ag picture too, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we encourage everyone to participate. Hopefully it'll be a fun working group and we can come up with some suggestions for the town board. Excellent. And just for anyone not um, paying attention to the chat, um, in Ted did um, verify, uh, in the monthly Danby area news on the back where the schedule is, it has all of the regularly scheduled meetings. There's a call-in number and then it'll ask you for the meeting ID and password, I believe, which is also listed on the back for people who would like to call in with a landline or whatever other phone. Well, I'm putting in the chat right now, the link to get on the planner email list, um, which will get you updates for these, these various meetings as well. And, you know, that, that's been up on the website since we just started, but, you know, getting, not everyone goes to the website um, five times a day like I do. Uh, so it, it's good to, you know, share this with your friends, post it on social media, um, send it to somebody who you know isn't going to find it otherwise. Um, because the more voices we get involved in this process, the better. Um, Ted also posted, you can come if you have a smart device or a, a laptop, you can come park in the town hall parking lot and access the public Wi-Fi from there. Um, or he's welcome, welcoming you to his house as well, if you know where that is. Um, but I do frequently, it's not weird. I see all kinds of people in our parking lot, um, including your county representatives, uh, will pull up in the parking lot to use the town's Wi-Fi. So <laughs> don't need to feel weird about that at all. And I will say that we're, you know, the vaccination is moving along briskly, so, so it may not be too much longer before we can resume in person. And we're trying to, we're not just trying, we're going to set ourselves up so that it will be possible to have meetings both in person and via Zoom. So for those who can't, uh, you know, free themselves up in order to drive to a meeting, they can continue to participate in Zoom, but people who, who uh, have it, find it difficult to do that, um, it will be possible to do, meet in person as well. So some of the working groups, it, it remains to be seen whether we, you know, we, we continue to have the working group meetings entirely by Zoom or, or whether we do some sort of hybrid thing with the, with the working groups too. Great, and the chat continues to fill up with other ideas about how people can get can get access, including um, going under the shelter at the fire hall where you can get their Wi-Fi. Right. So how about the general thrust of this? We, we have a lot of people that I haven't heard from before um, who are probably just hearing about, you know, you, maybe you heard something that the town's doing a zoning update. Um, you know, what brought you out tonight? What made you want to be involved in that process? And, you know, how do you think uh, development is going in the town. Do you like the way the, the town has been going in the last 10, 20 years? Is the change that you're seeing in the town uh, what you want to see? Is it the, the vision for the future that you have for the town? It's okay to be quiet, like I said. Since no one's speaking up, yeah. I just would like to say that uh, I live on East Miller Road, about a mile from Coddington. And I am not happy uh, with the amount of people that have, the amount of new buildings and lots that have appeared on East Miller Road. And also the fact that a lot of them are rentals at the bottom. And that in, 
increases the traffic. It's turned into a through road from 96B to Coddington. And uh, I'm hoping that there'll be some zoning indications on rental properties that have, that are off, that are not part of somebody who's living there, but just rental properties. And also maybe some uh, regulations or ways to limit all the traffic on roads. Um, I, I have a follow-up to that, that I, I um, share that, that uh, concern. I'm new to Danby. This is our sixth year. Um, we built in a subdivision, low-density subdivision, and I'm concerned with how you all are going to be regulating short-term rentals, long-term rentals, and Airbnb possibilities, and bed and breakfast possibilities when there is a zoning um, when it's clearly a family oriented zone, one family zone, how that's going to be, um, are you going to be looking at those regulations as well? Wow. <laughs> that's a great point, Deborah. Short term rentals is not something that is even defined in our current zoning. Um, so it's definitely a useful conversation to have about where, when, and how that's appropriate. Well, make this. Brown is another question, but what else? What else are people interested in? Well, I would like to uh, introduce myself. I moved, we built here uh, 2019 and to raise our kids near the family farm. And I'm just concerned about um the area that recently got sold a bunch of land getting developed into you know like a huge housing community next to you know where we hope to raise our kids and take them hunting and just worried about that lifestyle dream going away with a lot more housing coming in but at the same time also it'd be nice if we had you know a more of a commercial zone where we could have like you know, a cafe, maybe a post office, something. So it's it's like kind of give and take. Like I want to preserve the the rural aspect of life, but it's also, also be nice to have some conveniences. Sure, and I think there's probably different locations for those two things, right? Mm -hmm. Who else has a comment or a question? You have questions about the presentation? Uh, David, is um, infill properties gonna be looked at at all? I know other towns are looking at to, to raise density where there is already homes to, uh, to have infill so that you know, smaller properties could have an extra home on that property. Yeah, that's a great point, Jim. So uh, I think that's, that's kind of within the range of things we're looking at, you know, within the hamlet, I think the comprehensive plan prioritizes that the hamlets are where you really want to see infill development. Um, while we're looking at the low density residential zone, that's also a question. You know, are there parts of that zone that covers the vast majority of the town where it wouldn't be a problem to have some additional infill? You know, there's different ways you could do that. You could do that. Um, by making it easier to build a backyard cottage, a mother-in-law unit, or uh, or just a mother unit. It doesn't have to be an in-law. Nobody likes in-laws. <laughs> um, can we can we make allow more people to be in a house? You know, are people comfortable or interested in that in those areas where you know we've already built out to the allowed density of the low density residential zone? Um, you know, what else can fit there? What else makes sense? Or, or are those areas that shouldn't see change? Um, and do we just want to focus the change um, and new development in the hamlets? Um, but definitely, you know, looking at the hamlet, looking at, you know, how do we make that the place that be, really becomes the focus of development? Right now, it's easiest to develop outside of the hamlet. It's hard to develop in the hamlet. It's easy to subdivide off two acres from a 20-acre lot anywhere else in the town. 
there's nowhere in the town that's harder to develop right now than the hamlet and um, both the town's comprehensive plan and the county comprehensive plan uh, and good planning practice in general says we should be making it so that that's the first place that someone thinks about developing rather than the last place. I'd like to throw in a little bit thinking on this matter. The, the typical pattern of development historically in small towns is houses along the roads. In the beginning, it was all in the hamlets. And then over the course of the last 60 years or more, we've been sprawling out along the roads that exists into the countryside. But the thing that's persisted is that the development has mostly been along the roads. So there's a lot of undeveloped land behind the, the, the houses that exist. And it's not very many people who have houses behind them. They're mostly people are looking out on undeveloped land behind them, no matter where you are in town. But that way, Joel. Most I'm 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 making a generalization. Generally speaking, there, that's that's the pattern. You know, there's not a whole lot of there's a lot of undeveloped land behind. Despite the fact that the, the we were zoned for five acres, and all that back land. And, and in our recent experience with the with the proposal down in Puritan Hollow or adjacent to Puritan Hollow with the with the with the Wimsett property. Um, 90 acres was proposed to be developed and, and people were horrified to find that it, it could have accommodated as many as 18 houses using our current formula. If somebody had wanted to or had the pockets, the deep pockets to put in a road and create that many lots. That hasn't happened. It didn't happen there. It's, and it ha mostly hasn't happened around the rest of the town either because that's not where the market is at the moment. It's not, not that Danby's particularly special, it's not happening much of anywhere. What is happening is more of the same, more development along the road. But that won't always be the case. And 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 what I what I like us to think about is what about that back acreage? Are we are we comfortable with the prospect that if when economics change that somebody can put in a road and have for a hundred acres eight, 20 houses? Or is that or do we recoil at the prospect? And if we do recoil at the prospect, then what kind of density would we think is reasonable to put back there? You know, in, in the places that are behind your house, you know, what is that, if some- Why behind wanted, my house? Yeah, behind, behind anybody's house. You know, even, even, I mean, even here in the hamlet where I am, there's nobody behind. Um, although I'm a corner lot, so I can't quite say that, but you know, but almost every property has, undeveloped area behind them. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's characteristic of our, our, of our rural community. What happens, uh, I mean, there was, there's, there's one back area in, 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 in West Danby, it's, it's almost humorous. It was, it was, for a while it was on the maps as First Street. Like there was gonna be, someday there was gonna be a second and the third and the fourth, but you know, um, <laughs> but, but it hasn't happened. You know, the, the, uh, the closest, well, not the closest. We we do have a few places where, where people have built long driveways, and so people end up with houses behind. We've even uh, resisted the idea of flag lots, where people end up with houses behind houses, as being undesirable. But if that back acreage is going to be developable at all, um, it's it what we can't do. You know, it's become apparent is say, in our in our and regulations that one house for every five acres is okay. And then when somebody proposes anything close to, you know, one house in 20 acres, um, everybody gets upset because they want to do it at all. There's, we have to come to an accommodation about what kind of density would, is, 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 is reasonable in that, in that back acreage and how we would go about deciding uh, or, or, or locating the houses that would get put there. And the lower the density, the easier it is to come up with, with, a, with, a, with a process that says, let's look at the big picture here and say, where would you choose to put the houses and where would we like to avoid putting the houses? 
the more houses you're entitled to, the, the harder it is to, to avoid putting them where people would rather they not go. So that's, we have a process like that, but we haven't really had to apply it because the, the, like I say, there's not much of a market yet, but that's not necessarily always going to be the case. Our, our, our market in Tompkins County here is for houses. Uh, people, well, if you build a new house, it, it, it costs more to build than it's worth when you're done. People build them anyway um, because they want their dream house. And when they do it, they generally do it on rural properties because that's where they can buy the two to five acres. They can put their dream house in the middle of it someplace and then it doesn't really matter what their neighbors do. But, the, but another word for that is sprawl and, and it's happening all over. I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm just saying that you know this is the problem that we need to address, and and uh, and and it's, and it's what we're confronting now. What we've done in the in the, in the working group, what's focused on conservation so far, is try to identify where are the most special places in town, and what are the regulations that can be put in place to minimize the, the destruction of what's special about them. And we just started on that process, but there's a lot of of what is currently called the low density zone that is none of the above. You know, just, it's some of those neighborhood areas that, that, that David just described. Okay, so the, so the road frontage is built up, but the back acreage isn't. Do we wanna, do we wanna say that the, the kind of development that we have along the road frontage should also continue behind them? So that if you put it in, you could have, you could have back to back house lots. Uh, is that what we want? Or not. You know, there are alternatives, and you know things like clustering. And I suggested that for if we're going to try to preserve our agricultural land in, in agricultural zones, we should we should we should ask people to either have very big lots or very small lots, so that we don't sprawl all over over the land that we're trying to protect. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there, Joel, if you don't mind, because um, I wanted to bring up that idea and see how we can encourage it. I really appreciate what um, White Hawk is doing where they're grouping their houses together and keeping land open and doing a lot of creative things around um, growing food and um, you know different things like that. So I, th I think you're bringing up a lot of really good points and uh, I wonder how we can zone to encourage development like White Hawk is doing. I would like to chime in and just um, ask people to try to be realistic in their expectations. Uh, asking for a post office, which has absolutely zero, zero, I do mean zero chance of ever coming back to Danby is not realistic. The uh, US Postal Service has control over the post offices, the town does not. And the US Postal Service is closing down most of its post offices, all, including the rural post offices. Last year, Cayuta uh, had their po little in-house post office closed. Uh, the other post offices that are still in existence are having their hours cut way back. They're only open from uh, usually 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning until noon or 1 o'clock, like the Spencer Post Office. And the Spencer Post Office actually does sorting and delivering. So having a post office in Danby is really not realistic. And I don't even think that they would allow something like... Um, uh, a little box store where you might sell just postage stamps or something like that. You can get all of that stuff online these days and the post office isn't interested in hiring people and paying them to maintain little stations in the town of Danby. You're probably right, Alas. No, we haven't had one since the 1960s in the Hamlet and over in West Danby, when was it? It was like 1985 or 90 when the trailer was closed down. So it's unrealistic. Yep.
It looks like Ted is raising his hand. Is that what that is? Speak, Ted. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'd like to wait till be recognized. Um, just a little historical perspective on what you were saying about rural development, Joel. Uh, in the development of really rural towns, early development, people built their houses, well, farms, where it was appropriate to build farms, uh, whether it's good land or good geography or you name it, or even access, even a reasonable way to access larger towns. Then those were built to them. In other words, people didn't build by the roads because there were no roads, but the roads were built to them. Once the roads exist, that enabled a, a second wave of, of, of settlement where people would build along the roads. And absent any planning, uh, that's the natural way of things. Uh, at this point, we're reaching a point where we have to think about whether that's the best way to continue. Um, that, that said, uh, I, I guess what I sent out to email last night was maybe a day early. Um, if you talk about uh, expanding the interior of our blocks, and you know, roughly speaking, many of the blocks in Danby are one mile on a side, one you know, one section of land, six hundred forty acres. Uh, if you talk about expanding to the interior intentionally rather than as the exception with such as people with long driveways, um, you're raising a whole lot of planning issues um, beyond just getting people to live in each other's backyards. You're losing some of the rural quality, rural character quality that we have now, which is built on being able to look into those interiors. Uh, you're going to have you're either going to require the building of roads acceptable to the town for maintenance therefore growing the um, uh, shall we say the cost of running the town or you're going to have to allow some way for people to get into the interior uh, hopefully not through really messy flag lots but more likely through shared driveways or other access methods just a perspective yeah well, I mean, I, I wasn't suggesting that we would want to, but only, the, only that what we currently have in place not only doesn't preclude it, 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 uh, it entitles it. Yeah. And for what it's, for what it's worth, flag lots remind me of something else worth mentioning. Most of the flag lots in town are what you might call... Uh, they're very, a lot of them have some very creative property line drawing, which isn't actually, well, in my humble opinion, terribly natural. Um, mm -hmm. They're to provide access to, to areas that, well, they, you get some crazy shaped parcels. But there are examples in town where flag lots, and by the way, for those of you who don't know what they are, imagine a flagpole uh, where you have a very, long pole with a flag at the top imagine that as a property that's that's a nice flag <laughs> flag lot do i recognize where that is i think um it's comfort road yes <laughs> um why don't you show some of the flag lots on west king road those are those would be interesting but flag lots can work very nicely such as several uh near you betsy uh kiyakoski on um on east miller where the properties are large the flags are really thin and in fact the properties are accessed by a shared driveway which isn't necessarily their um uh, the flagpole <laughs> and those really work you you're basically on a little private road heading well it's it's a driveway not a road you head way back into the interior and the, those work they work, but the, it, there are a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but I, I mostly hear from people who are unhappy when somebody builds behind them. It would, they're large enough so that the behind is not visible. You're talk, we're talking some truly large properties. Yeah. Just, David, if you can show that, it's uh, around the 600 block of, um, of East Miller. East Miller, oh, sure. Yeah, there's one like that. Uh, up behind me where the driveway is 2,000 feet long. 
And that, that property back there is more than 20 acres. And so he's very far from his nearest neighbor and uh, his, his property is actually landlocked or it was initially, it was landlocked and should never have been allowed to be built on that way because we don't allow mm -hmm. landlocked parcels. Yeah, uh, what, what David is showing there, uh, uh, although one corner of one lot is unfortunately juxtaposed with, an, with another house, those large uh, properties back there, you go down the driveway and you're in another, you're in another world. Um, uh, where's that fella there? You, you notice the game that was played here because they, 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 they generally have the 200 feet of frontage on the road and then yeah. it narrows into, uh, into the pole. That's right. So that, That's so what that, I would... you, know, you need. You need 200 because of our requirement for frontage. You, know, you got the frontage, and then you narrow it down, and then you go back to the lot behind. Yeah, that's that's what I call. I described as creative lot draw, uh, line drawing, yes. uh, creative property line drawing. But you know, if, if you're, you know, let me just get the right uh, tool there, if I made it. You know, when you head down this this driveway. I'm not sure we can it's originally see. there to access a house out here, but it's there also you. shared to about here to access another house. It works. You know, forget the creative line drawing. It's unfortunate, but it's a, a, a feature of our of our zoning. Mm -hmm. But these guys, they're not they're not going to bother anybody out there. Has what anybody been to, to the I had a question about this when I was looking at the map the other day. Uh, has anybody been back to that pond or whatever it is that's listed as VBB there uh, because it's rather unusual to have a, 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 a body of water at a peak of a hill. And so I was wondering if that was a, a constructed pond or if that was something natural. If you look at Google Google Maps or satellite view, it looks pretty uh, constructed. Yes. Oh, you think it's constructed because I uh, that you think that's constructed? Um, Ron, I think you're. I think it is. Is the, I think you're talking uh, about this. It's, this one yes i think I, I doubt is constructed because it's connected oh the one the one i'm thinking of is this one yeah here. so i was looking at the whole hill from a geological perspective and i i think that's something more like one of these uh kind of glacial cams or whatever you want to call it which would be really unusual in danby we don't have anything like that so we we should take an interest in that little space there I think it's worth noting that these lots that Ted was saying, um, you know, is fine. It doesn't bother anyone. Um, you can, my how, circle moved because I moved the page, but. How big are they? 27.75 uh, acres, uh, 33 acres, 12 acres, 100 acres. Um, so, I mean, if we had, if we were willing to zone for, you know, the back acreage for 20, you know, one house for one, one, one house for every 20 acres, then we'd be, it would be fine um, at that level. Well, as long as they stayed 20 acres, if somebody started to divide them up, we'd be in trouble. Well, Joel, I'm, I'm having that's a little point. difficulty here, Joel, because you and I had a conversation two nights ago. And you said the one in 10 is. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just let saying me, that, you know, let me, it, let me nobody would have a problem with 20 acres. Let me, let me finish. I have a problem with 20. And most landowners who are larger landowners in town have a problem with that because I've gone out and talked to quite a few of them. And now you're back to one in 20, which was Rhonda's crazy idea of one in 25. That's ridiculous. That is a take for people who have not been on those emails. It was not a diatribe, David. I feel like I'm standing up the lone man with my fingers in the dike trying to stop the dike from coming in. I don't uh, think you know what a take taking is, Russ. You're taking, you're taking the value of land from landowners 
without compensation. You're taking away our development rights. If you're buying our development rights as TDRs, that would be a different story, but you're not doing that. You're saying that a hundred acre lot that used to be able to put 20 houses and that's the value uh, of land is the building lot on a piece of property could then only have four houses you're severely reducing it. My example was if your house was worth 200,000 in Danby and the town board rezoned it so your value went down from 200,000 to 50,000, how would you feel? And that's what's being done to large landowners in this town if you go to that size lot. And Joel, you said that was not on the table. That's not the major thing being talked about and listen to you. You're talking about it. I'm sorry about my attitude, but you're dealing with my nest egg. All my assets are tied up in my land. And you need, you, you need to align what you're saying with what you are saying. You are talking about huge lot sizes for land, and that's not fair to landowners. I don't think that's really quite accurate because what he was saying was um, somebody argued that if you have back land, then there's somebody behind you and it's going to impact your property, your house, because you're right behind you and they can see you. Joel said, if he, they gave examples, all of those back lots were 20, 80, 100 lots, big size. Joel said, if they're all that, then, then it's not going to have the impact on the neighbors. He didn't say they should be. He said, if they are what they are now, then it would not have impact on the neighbors. Well. I, I hear you, Pat, and you know, I, I, I understand that. We lived in Queens, New York City with a 50 by 100 lot that was double the size of most lots. So we had lots of neighbors where you could reach out the window and shake their hand practically. Um, so it's much different here. But really the thing is, if you have a five acre lot, you can't stop someone from building next door unless you buy that land. It, I, I understand you think the view is yours, but it's not. Somebody else owns it. First, they bought it with their own money or it was inherited to them through their family. Someone in their family bought it. And secondly, they're paying the expense of rent called taxes every year on it. So they're, they're really funding that view. And you got to keep that in mind. And you cannot take people's rights away to do what they want and the freedoms that they have in their land. We're not talking about toxic waste dumps or stuff like that that's going to harm everyone. I understand you don't want a house next to yours, but if you don't own the land, someone can do that. Ted, on the other hand, bought a big chunk of land and he won't have a neighbor right next to him because he owns it, but he's he has a right to that. I don't think other people can tell large landowners what to do. Um, I just want to make it clear that um, actually my husband and I owned a uh, 75 acres here. We are one of the large landowners. And I, I think um, I want to make sure that I'm being clear. Russ, we, I think it's valuable to have your voice. And, you know, I've talked to you about bringing in uh, more um, people who share your perspectives because it, it is a minority perspective in most of the groups that have gathered. Um, there's a few, I think, uh, technical oh. points that I, I hope that our group can be clear on because it's come up a lot of times and I, I want to make sure that everyone understands it. Um, there, there's a difference between um, making an argument that something is illegal and making an argument that it's immoral. And something that you've said a lot is that something is a taking. Um, and I've heard other people say it's stealing. And there's a difference there between if we want to make an argument about what's moral for the town to do um, and what's legal because a, a taking is something that's very okay. specific. A taking is when a government regulation removes all value from a parcel and changing the development potential from a parcel doesn't take all value from the parcel. Um, it could even reduce it, but even reducing value is not a taking. That's not what the definition of a taking is. Um, and you know, I think it's great to have a, a voice um, being in this conversation and talking about what that means to you and what that means to other landowners. Um, but I wanna make sure that we're clear about when we're talking about legal things, it is legal for the town to set requirements um, for development and to change 
including reducing the allowed development. Um, and there's very specific uh, case law about what is a taking and how much value needs to be removed to become a taking. Um, and that's not, that's not anything near what is being discussed here. Um, so I, I think I want to acknowledge that, yes, it's perfectly reasonable to feel like that's wrong. It's something you don't want to have happen. Um, but I, I want to get the, the terminology correct that it's not a taking, um, but it is something you don't want to see. And there may, I can see in the chat, there's other people who feel the same way and don't want to see that as well. So I think we David, I, I don't see how you don't see it as stealing. If if my land value, I, mean, I, I, I sent on that email and I sent you the email with it. So you have it to share on this group or any other group now that th four properties that sold greater than five acres, which is how real estate agents distinguish uh, large land tracts from lots, sold for a little over 4,000 an acre in our town since January 1st, 2020. Three lots sold for less than five acres. They were all two to three acres. They sold for over $16,000 an acre for, the two, for those three lots in the same time frame. So for anybody here to say that we're gonna change your land from being one house for every five acres to one house for every 25 acres, and we're not taking your value, stealing your equity, you have a lot of explaining to do because that's, that's new math to me. Well, let me oh, let me uh, yeah. let me start the, uh, the the equation. The the reality of it is that the, most of the equity lies along the existing frontage. The, the, the back land is worth less simply because it doesn't have access to the road, and it's hard to break that up into into smaller lots without without creating the access. And we have so far very few roads accessing that back acreage people have bought big chunks and put in long driveways as as, as the examples that we just looked at indicated uh, they haven't put in they haven't broken up those back acreages into smaller lots and created a road to go back there to them because of the expense of doing it and there's no market for those small lots the the the, the, the subdivisions that we have had in Danby, when, when people think subdivisions, they think of something like, like uh, Old Town um, Village or, or Old Town Road or the, or the uh, Fieldstone yeah, Circle yeah. Yes. Or, or the CMC development, Beersley Lane. All of those developments filled in very slowly. We've got one over here in West Danby that's been sitting for 20 years, an eight, a seven lot subdivision, that two of the lots have sold because that's not what people are looking for. So say, you know, I, if I had the joining parcel, well, gee, it could, you could put a road in there too and make, you know, 14 more lots at the currently allowed density, but that's not, there's no market for it. You know, the, 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 the frontage acreage is where the equity lies and, and the landowners recognize that the last time around, which is why we have this, this peculiar formula that says, you know, 200 feet of road frontage or two acres on the existing roads five acres overall is because recognizing that, that we had that with two acre zoning along the, uh, every place before and we down zoned the five acres on the back acreage at that point. And it had a negligible impact on property values and it had a negligible impact on the development pattern as well because it's the frontage acreage that's being sold off, not the back land. Mm -hmm. But so wouldn't you agree, and I think most people here Agree, and I've been on record saying this. I think that that development along the road, where you break off two acres or 200 feet, or even 400 feet, and put a house on it, is really, really ugly. Um, if anyone lives on on Nelson Road um, near toward us, or toward Steam Mill, I apologize, but those houses are quite ugly that are there. Um, with I don't know what size lots uh, Ted developed them into. But and he had a right to do that, but it is pretty pretty doggone ugly. And um, I don't think we wanted to see our town be developed where all the road frontage gets developed up. And uh, you know, I sent Joel and, and David an email tonight uh, of an idea that Kim and I even had is what about instead of just making huge lot sizes or 
house per huge number of acres to curtail development, why not put a huge setback like 300 feet for the road where it's back off the road, back in the woods, tucked away, not really right up on the road visible. And that would allow our rural character to be there with a house back off the road. Um, it, it would still allow people to live here, still allow people to sell their land if they need the money and the equity and a, a allow us to still have a rural character with houses back set back in. I mean, I think there's other ways to, to do it, but we, well, we I agree. We, and, uh, and not only that, I think that what you're, what, you're, what, you're, what you're suggesting, Russ, I think is exactly what we need to do, which is to say, if we're going to ask people to not develop along the road in order to, to, to forego the easy low hanging fruit, we have to create opportunities for Houses to housing to be created off the road, in perhaps in clusters, where the access is made easier in exchange for preserving some of that road frontage. But, um, the, but we, but we have to be careful with how easy we make it. If we so far, if you put a road in, it has to be to our current specs, which is David described earlier: twenty feet pay plus four foot shoulders plus ditches which is hugely expensive and, and a major uh, 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 fragmentation of the environment associated with it as well. If we enable, uh, a, if we create a, a, a road spec that's, that's more like a driveway, that it, will, it, will, it would make it less of an economic hurdle, but it will also open up a lot of back acreage to development, which we may or may not be too happy about. So we have to be really careful how we do it so that we're not, just opening up a whole, we're, we're, we'll be creating a, we'll be creating a windfall for those large landowners with the back acreage. About make, that. If we make it easier to, to develop that back acreage, and if we, if we compensate for the increased ease with the decreased density, we can probably make it so that they're, they're in, nobody's being hurt, but we can maybe get some value some of the development away from the road frontage in, 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 in sort of a trade-off. Yes, I, I understand, Joel. And that's why in your original proposal of one development lot for every 10 acres, I was agreeable because I saw that you gave some give backs. There was a give and take and it was a compromise and it was good. But then when you get ideas that say 25 acres for a building lot, that's unreasonable. And I strongly oppose it in that meeting and unfortunately I missed the next one and was not able to say anything. But there's a lot of people, there's people on the Zoom meeting who are sitting there very quiet, not saying a thing, who are very opposed to that as well. Um, yeah, but there might be, and that was what came out of the meeting that you missed, there might be some people, some landowners in some parts of town, particularly the less developed parts of town, who would be okay with, with, with a density um, lower than 10, who, who might be okay with 15, or 20 or 25. We can't, I, I'm personally, I don't think that we, the town, uh, meaning the town board, will be, will be willing to impose a, a, a lower density than 10 without a willing group of landowners in, that, in, 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 in core areas. So we're saying we in our part of the town really value the open space and we will be willing to go with a lesser, a lesser number, you know, with, with, with with 15 or 20. Absent that, I think what we have to do is a combination of approaches, which is what we've been trying to do. That's why we have a conservation easement program where people voluntarily relinquish some of their development rights in the interest of maintaining open space. And it's you know the combination of voluntarily giving them up um, and, 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 and having the town reduce the density reg in, on the regulatory side uh, you know, can can help us retain our rural character, but it, but what we're not going to get any benefit out of zoning unless we can drop the density to you know below what would sort of naturally happen if we didn't have any zoning at all. And and right now, the only thing that's really kept us from having uh, the back acreage developed is the same thing that's kept it from being developed in every town. It's too expensive. Our zoning has done little to nothing to inhibit residential uh, expansion in the town of Danby. 
or to focus it anywhere. It doesn't do, it's not doing a good job of um, saying, making it easier to develop where the town wants it or making it harder to develop where the town doesn't want it. And I, that's, that's the core of planning is prioritizing some areas over other areas because some areas make more sense and some areas make less sense. Um, and that, that's what we have to come to consensus about. Um, I see Ted is noting that Nancy has her hand raised symbol up. I think that's been up the whole meeting, Nancy, but if you have something to say, oh, you just, oh, muted, you just yourself. muted yourself. Too. <laughs> you just muted yourself, Nancy. There you go. Nope. Yeah. Joel, while she figures out on muting, I, I am not opposed to voluntary uh, large lot size right. things. Okay. So uh, the conversation has moved very in very interesting ways since I had my hand up. But <laughs> I wanted to bring back, um, just quickly, bring back a question I have about the Hamlet development. And I spent a lot of time in, because our, we own the gathering in my studio right down there, and I'm there all day long. It's very loud. I don't know um, because of the traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure if that's being taken into consideration in terms of creating more housing, but also the water in um, that part of Danby, like our shop, and I think also at the town hall it's not very good water. My friend D at the end of East Miller Road, she doesn't drink her road, her water, her road, <laughs> her water. So um, do you know if there's areas in the, this hamlet that, that those, the air, that they have access to good water in those areas? Because it's really important because we don't have any municipal water. That's my one question. It is um, important. And until, re until a few years ago, we had no way of knowing. We had we didn't have the information about what kind of water, what was our water availability? You know, you can is taste how much, it. Of, a, how much <laughs> of a constraint <laughs> is it? <laughs> we do now know, you know, because we had the aquifer study done, uh, what our water resources are in, in the in the valley of, ha of, of Danby, um, north and south. And uh, it is limited. It's not, you know, we're not going to turn into Trumansburg because it's not enough water to do that unless we pipe it in from, from the lake. But but um, it's a confined aquifer, limited capacity, but it will support you know, a reasonable amount of residential growth in the valley. As you go up the slopes, um, water availability becomes even more constrained. And, and that's one of the things that we talked about in, in, in the conservation group is perhaps uh, setting a, a, a lower density in some areas because of the limited availability of water. So do you know where the better water is? I mean, there's a lot That's of houses down, on, on down, it, it, I can't imagine everybody. It's, it's um, down here in West Danby. has bad water. <laughs> it's down here in West Danby. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> from well, the heavy water ran downhill. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> from my experience, it's also somewhat of a hit or miss from well to well. Yeah, it is. I it was very down there, Sarah. How's your water? I think it's fine. It's if, it's, if it is a heavy rain, it's a little sulfury, but yeah, I mean, ours is good sometimes and bad other times, so it comes to go. I just think that should be a consideration. Um, and I, I'm wondering what our goals are here. I mean, are we trying to be market driven? Like, are we, you know, and I'm really confused because I'm hearing you don't want houses on the road because it's not attractive. But at the same time, we're concerned about developing behind the houses because it impacts the wildlife and the ecosystem. It's expensive to bring electricity up and have taken care of longer driveways. So it, it's, it, I'm very confused um, about how we're gonna get this all figured out by like May, you know? So, um, I'm not saying we can't do it. I'm, I'm very encouraged by with the process and with David's uh, presentation, but what are our goals? Are we gonna try to be market-driven like what people wanna buy? Are we gonna create it and they will come? I think it's really important to sort of think about that mm -hmm. um, because anybody will buy anything right now. You know, I mean, it's, it's really a pretty intense land grab. I don't know if it's gonna last, it's hard to say, but 
I think it's timely that we did the moratorium right now. Um, one of the things I think we should talk about, uh, so I have a whole bunch of little things I want to just mention. I think we should talk about light and noise in terms of um, maybe if you're going to have more houses closer together, then there should be some, at least within the planning process, the, uh, the noise and the light from another house close to somebody who didn't expect to have a close neighbor should be part of the process and the planning. Um, and then my other thing, last thing is, um, there's a lot of land on Gunderman Road where the old Danby school is. And a couple of years ago, we went and talked to them, the school, the uh, superintendent of schools about buying that. And he seemed to be kind of interested Really? And should we be focusing on trying to create, um, you know, like court a developer to come here and create a, a, a community there, like, you know, sort of in the Hamlet area? I don't know. I haven't been to a Hamlet group, so I've asked a lot of questions, which I have a tendency to do. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we can tackle them and or not, whatever. That's just kind of what's on my mind. But these are the questions that the Hamlet's group is in fact asking though. Yeah, the, uh, the school is outside of the area that the Hamlet group is really looking at. Um, although we certainly discussed it as, you know, one of the parts of the town that does have development potential. Oh no, sorry, I'm wrong, it's not. It is within the area, it's in the, it's in within the, the Hamlet Mark, neighborhood isn't it? area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we we've also I think that is an area that certainly has potential as well as um, the old Dobson parcel is another part of the Hamlet area that has a lot of um, potential to be. You know, what, what, I'm sorry. What did you just say, David? I didn't quite. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I said that the school is an area that the group has looked at and it is within the Hamlet neighborhood area and it definitely has. Um, development potential, and then there's also um, the Dobson parcel um, that is being cleaned up and um, does have the potential to transition because it's a large lot in the Hamlet under um, single ownership. Um, but it's you know it's a long term, mm -hmm. probably with, both long long term right, with, with fewer development constraints than a lot of the Hamlet, which is another issue we have in trying to grow the hamlet is that just you know between between the wetlands and the and the creek um there's a lot of a lot of constraints yep um we are uh coming up on nine o'clock quickly which is when we like to wrap these things up um so you know I, there's a lot of people who haven't had a chance to say something yet if anyone who hasn't spoken yet would like to chime in this is a good chance. I, I would, David. Uh, it's Toby Dean uh, from Yaple Road. Uh, for hey, Toby. Uh, people seem to have seized on a minimum lot size changing, but the direction we were sort of going or possibly going towards was a, a lot density or density of housing rather than lot size. Right. And I'm, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around that. Um, and if you just could sort of describe what housing density is, that would be helpful, David. Sure. Um, so what we're, what we're talking about is a concept called density averaging. Um, where there's a lot of ways you can divide up one large parcel. And um, just to make it easy, I'm going to make up numbers that are round. So let's say you had a 100 acre parcel. Um, the way the current low density residential zoning works is that new lots that you create can be as small as two acres. But in addition to that, the overall average density can't be greater than five acres per unit or per lot. So you had a hundred acres and you wanted to make uh, a bunch of um, two acre lots 
you can have a maximum of 19 two acre lots and then one lot that's all the rest of the area. And that gets you to 20 lots, um, which is an average of one lot for every five acres, even though all but one of those lots are smaller than five acres. Um, and there, there's various ways that that could play out and be different. Um, and it allows you to cluster um, the development that does happen on one portion of a lot and then preserve the rest of the lot as open space. Um, so one of the things, uh, one of the possibilities that the conservation group discussed and that Joel proposed um, is that there could be a zone, some areas where the, the average density changed to um, one lot per 10 acres. Uh, but then the new lots that could be created were allowed to be even smaller than currently allowed lots. So maybe you could have one and a half acre lots and you could cluster them all in one part of a parcel and then preserve all the rest of the parcel. So you'd have kind of a, a little rural cluster of housing and you'd have a large, um, large contiguous area of open rural area that could continue being a farm or a forest or, or other um, open space area uh, in perpetuity. So you can get the same, um, you can get the houses that you would be able to build if you just built them all along the street, um, but there's also area that's preserved. And so it's kind of a compromise. Um, and I, I think finding compromises like that, I don't know if that's exactly the one, but finding compromises like that is what this process is you know, leaning towards. And I'd like it so that we could even go to smaller lots yet, and, and that would that will require us coming up with a mechanism for enabling and facilitating, making easy um, shared services. So that if if you if if like an eco village where they have a shared septic system, um, you can then go to even you, know, you can go to quarter acre lots if you want and have a real little neighborhood. You know, it'd be a little and and. There is a way to do some of that in the current zoning, which is the cluster subdivision option. So right now, let's say you have a right to build um, 10 lots, uh, 10 lots at a five acre density. So you have 50 acres, you can build 10 lots. Um, the, the normal way to do that would be to have all of those lots be at least two acres. Um, but through clustering, you can make those lots smaller. You could even make um, each one be a townhouse. So you could build 10 townhouses in one corner of a 50 acre lot and then have all the rest of that preserved as open space. Um, so you get a little more density in one area, but you get a lot more open space in the rest. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say two things. Um, I just had two priorities in my mind. Um, a conservation overlay, which would, uh, which was on your list, David, and second, which is closer to the cluster um, uh, subdivisions, is that we need to focus on affordable housing. We we've talked a lot today about large landowners and effects to them, but there are we need to consider affordable housing and affordable options, um, either in the hamlet or as a cluster subdivision in the low density zone, something of that effect. I just wanted to point those two things out. Mm -hmm. Bruce. Yes, Joel, I wanted to speak a little bit about procedure here to make sure I get things straight. Uh, uh, it was my assumption that uh, this process through the moratorium would be looking at uh, uh, different proposals at the working group and they would come back through the planning group and uh, and as a member of the planning board we have a chance to uh, weigh in here at the planning group or at the planning board meetings <clears throat> but in a conversation I had with you earlier today or was it yesterday but anyway <clears throat> you indicated that the uh, uh, recommendations from the working groups will be going directly to the town board and uh, I think everyone needs to be clear on that. I think I, uh, I think when Kelly was uh, asking, uh, you know, uh, how to proceed as a town board member, a planning board member, uh, to, to 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 join this process, I, I may have given her a bum steer because I, <clears throat> I thought that the uh, the work from the from the uh, 
so the different groups would come packed back through the group. But th what we are saying is that if, if we're going to get our input on this and we're going to uh, actually uh, influence the uh, the work product, we need to do it at at, at, at the breakout, at the work groups, at the uh, Hamlet group uh, conservation, you know, at that, at that level. I just want to make sure I'm straight on that. Yeah, the accelerated timeline makes it, make, makes it virtually impossible for us to continue the way we have been with, with having the working groups report to the planning group and, then, and hashing things out in the planning group to see uh, whether we have consensus before moving it to the town board for consideration. Um, I think, practically speaking, we're going to have to go from the working groups to the planning to the town board, uh, and then get and then get the town board going to send it back for 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 you know further 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 reworking, um, or 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 just move the process along. But um, David, do you agree that that's kind of necessary? I do think um, so. I think there's two parts to this question, Bruce. And I think the first one is that the place to be most effective is at the working group. The place that, you know, if you want to be involved in the consideration of what the current low density residential zone turns into those different zones, that work is happening at the conservation working group. And if you want to be involved in the Hamlet uh, zoning, that work is happening at the Hamlet working group. Um, and I think with the schedule we've laid out to have something come out of the conservation working group and then come for review at the planning group, which is what the working groups are made out of um, before going to the town board. Um, you know, I think we need input from the town board on this, but I think it would be really difficult with the schedule to have and not very useful to have the, the planning, have something finish at the working group level and then rehash it at the combined planning group level, which is basically the planning group is the working groups put together before it goes to the town board meeting, um, which is the, the third, is it the third Monday, the third Tuesday right. of the month. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I think should really happen is that, um, for that, that work that comes out of the working groups, I think the town board meeting is kind of gonna be, that special town board meeting is gonna be like the planning group meeting. And we, we need to figure out how that works, how that's a spot for where everyone comes together um, at those combined meetings uh, where we're spitting out the, the work, um, the completed work for review by the planning board and the CAC and the town board. Um, but I, I do think that that direction needs more discussion um, with, with the various boards. I see Claire has her hand up. Yeah, just, I basically just wanted to support what you just said roughly, David. I and mean, I actually thought at our last meeting, which I suppose was just the conservation group, that we had rather abolished the planning group because none of us wanted to go to a meeting every night a week for two hours. So. Um, I thought, and I think we all felt that the planning group really was redundant as a as a as a group. So, just supporting what you said, basically. One thing uh, we should I, I should mention is that we we have a regular meeting time now for the for the um, zoning outside of the Hamlet group or <laughs> the, the conservation group, which is which is on, on um, we've settled on, on Fridays, which is a peculiar choice, but um, it seemed to work for a lot of people. So um, that group is meeting uh, every other week. Uh, First and third Fridays, I thought. Right. Um, and, uh, but we haven't yet established a regular meeting time for the, for the Hammett working group, um, nor do we have a regular working uh, meeting time for the for the for the agricultural working group, we do, however, have a potential. Um, it, it seemed that, that, having thought about it, there were only a couple of possibilities for the Hamlet working group, and and I, and I think it's worth. It might be worth running those uh, by people here, so that uh, to see what would work for those who are interested in doing that. Um, would it work 
So, and there were Thursdays and Fridays, basically. And Dave, you want to you want to handle that um, polling? I'm some, we're not hearing you somehow. Still not, still not. So somehow, somehow we've lost your, you've lost your audio. Check your mic connection. Zoom thinks you have audio. So while David's coming back on, um, online, this is Melissa. I was wondering um, what Claire was saying. So, so um, is that something that's going to be happening where the overall planning group is going to stop meeting and instead just be meeting with the working groups or uh, will it continue to meet at this time? I was a little confused about that. Well, it, it would, essentially it's being proposed that we stop having our regular meetings. Uh, at least until we get past the, the crunch time here with, with getting this all together. So, so this particular meeting would go away in favor of the working group. Correct, correct. Okay, is that something that, um, you know, everybody's for? Well, we could we could ask that question. <laughs> I see, hey, there hey it looks like it's catching me again. I literally changed nothing. I have no idea. I don't even have an external mic. It's just through the laptop, but wow. decided to find me again. Um, I see a question from Jess Sapansky. How do we get involved in the working group meetings? Um, and the answer is uh, those working group meetings are on the town calendar and will also be announced on the email list that I um, pasted into the chat earlier to get on. Um, those are Zoom meetings just like this one. Um, the conservation group meetings uh, as Claire mentioned, are the first and third Fridays of the month. Um, I think we need to find the, a date, but it, it'll probably be the second and fourth Thursday or Friday of the month for the Hamlet group. Um, and then the third Monday of the month is when the town board special monthly meeting for reviewing this, um, this goes. And I, I think, Joel, what we're really talking about um, with the, the planning group is really combining that the planning group meeting and the and the town board meeting. So that that's Thank really you. it's the town board meeting um, where people would come to get updates on completed work, um, which is different from you know participating in completing the work, which is happening at the working group level. So we haven't had the discussion yet at the town board level of how we would handle all that. It, it could be, it could be handled like a like a planning group meeting. Uh, the um, with with you know with broad participation, uh, it 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 we have we need to talk about you know to what extent the town board will want to um, focus on its own discussion as part of that part of that meeting. Um, and how the votes get taken when as far as moving the process along because ultimately the town board has to has to agree on what it wants to entertain and, 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 and put forth to the public for consideration. So we'll need to talk about it, but, but clearly um, it's going to be that, 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 that town board meeting is going to end up being the, a, a substitute for um, or an expansion of, depending on how it plays out, you know, the, the, the planning group meeting as a whole. I don't know if that's what we agreed on as the town board when we set that third meeting. It was an opportunity for us to discuss things that are proposed to us. Yeah, well, I'm okay. not. I'm not that's, in that's favor I'm of saying, a four we, or five hour meeting. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. You know how how we, how we handle it is, is something we didn't we didn't talk about at all. But and we need well, so we'll have to have that conversation. But but anyway, but what is clear is that we 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 probably. Well, maybe it's not. I mean, you know, Alyssa, Alyssa raised the possibility that maybe, maybe the, the planning group wants to continue, uh, and, you know, and have that meeting in addition to um, the, 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 the taking things to the town board directly or, or instead of going directly. I, 
was really just looking for clarity on, on so that everybody understood whether the full planning group was moving forward. I, I don't really have a thoughts on it either way. Mm -hmm. Although yeah. today's participation was pretty good. It was indeed. Um, well, we, we've had some good planning group meetings, but the, um, it's not clear to me that this kind of conversation couldn't happen at the, at the, at the town, at the third town board meetings. Um, consider that, you know, half of this meeting was spent in this kind of conversation. And if it was focused on specific proposals coming out of, of the um, working group, then, um, you know, a broader could, discussion could be had and then the town board could, could, could have a, you know, sort of a, a separate or, or a more limited conversation amongst the group about how to, you know, where, how to handle it and where to proceed from there. Yeah. So I, I think that that's a great conversation to have for the town board to have and to decide. Um, at this point, I think we're, we're at 906 and I, I want people to be sure that they know how they can participate going forward. Um, which I think the most important, the, the low density residential rezoning is at the conservation working group, which is the first and third Fridays at 7 p.m. Um, by Zoom. And they'll all be on the town calendar and also on the uh, email list that you can sign up for and, um, and the other ways that I talked about getting that out through the, the planning web page and the calendar um, as well so that's as the first and third. First and third. And I, I think that's really the, I think having two meetings of the working groups a month makes sense. And then we were kind of running out of how many meetings can we have in a year, in a week or in a month and still actually get anything done in between them. Right. So I see Ted's hand. Yeah, I just, um, it occurred to me that what you're talking about with two meetings a month for the conservation group and Joel also referred to it as the not the hamlet working group um if, if the substantive discussions which ha have been happening there about zoning you know numbers and details uh be seem to be becoming the the thrust of the main thrust of what might be this group why not simply shift that focus here and leave the conservation group talking about strictly conservation issues giving you know giving us more more to talk about here and that would uh, also simplify the, as, the structure as chair of the conservation advisory council you sound as though you're 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 cloning us well that is an interesting question <laughs> yeah um that, that another reason to shift that that major thrust here yeah well i mean i i'm I don't. I don't see much virtue in it, you know, frankly. I would like to know how many people. Who, well, first of all, we we have we still have more than one screen's worth of people here, so it's hard to see. If it's like a show of hands of how many people who who are interested in the Hamlet working group uh, would work would prefer Thursday over a Friday. Uh, can we can we do that somehow? Um, Joel, my, my concern is I think I'd rather do that over email. I'll, I'll make sure to get out a doodle poll. Okay, so we'll do a doodle tomorrow, poll. But I, we'll have, we can do a couple of doodle polls because we've got... That weren't, aren't here tonight. Okay, we could do a couple of doodle polls, one for the, for the Hamlet group and another one for the agricultural working group. Yep. And, and get that work. Um, um, I've, I've seen a few questions in the... In the chat about you know participating in the groups um, so i want to be clear you don't have to live in the hamlet to join the hamlet group uh, in fact i really wish we could get more people who do live in the hamlet in the hamlet working group that's something we've identified as something that would be helpful um, but that's it's currently mostly people who don't live or own property in the hamlet though we do have a few few um key people who who do um, so both groups are or all I think we have five working groups are open to anyone. Um, and if you have further questions that you don't want to bring up here, you're welcome to email me, planner at townofdanbyny.org, um, or give me a call. Um, 
stuff is flying in the chat faster than I can respond to it all. So I'm, I might miss you. Right. Uh, uh, but do sign up for the, the email list that's on the town's um, landing page, which is townofdanbyny.org. Um, there's a link there to get on the email list if you haven't found it in the chat already. Um, thank you, Carol. I see Carol Bushford is interested in the Hamlet Working Group. Um, and uh, yeah, I think Alyssa, great point. The Hamlet Group is talking about development of Hamlets. So if, if you don't want to see the Hamlets developed, it's not really a very functional group for you to be involved in, although we have had some people um, who wanted to talk about not developing the Hamlets there. Um, and you know, so you can choose which areas you participate in um, based on what's most interesting to you. Uh, with that said, I, I'd like to thank you all for participating today. You know, these are long, hard meetings, and we're having hard discussions. Um, I, I think this meeting went well. People uh, did a good job listening to each other, um, and you know, I've seen a lot of that so far. It's really heartening. It's really nice to see neighbors interacting and getting to know each other. So I want to thank you all for doing that and encourage you to continue participating. Um, do you have any other notes from the town board members or other people before we go? Uh, so thank I you, have Jay. one last um, thing, just a technicality. This group is subject to open meetings law based on our enabling resolution yep. and all the emailing back and forth is technically yep. in violation of that. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to be having discussions the same way the town board can't have discussions in numbers of a quorum that's not in a public meeting, um, which I did, I texted Joel to find out what that number is, but I think it's changing or is the quorum based on the core membership? I can't remember, but just to keep that in mind and it's a way to make sure everybody knows what we're talking about to make sure discussions happen in a public meeting. Thanks Sarah, that's an important point. Anything else before we go? No. All right. Well, thank you all. Have a wonderful night. Luckily, you don't all have to drive home because we're all at home already, except me. I'm at town hall. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Yes. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Night. Night. Good night.